Good morning, everyone. Today we're talking about the second theme of Advent, which is peace. So you heard a reading at the beginning, but remember, Advent is about looking toward the coming of Christ. We look toward the coming of Christ at Christmas, in his birth, but we also look to him fulfilling hope, joy, love, and peace when he comes again. And we look forward to that and wait. So this morning, as I said, we are going to be talking about peace. It's a concept that most of us have heard of, and it's been on the minds of humans since the beginning of time. If we look all the way back to the beginning of time, we look at Adam and Eve's sons, Cain and Abel. And when sin enters the world, we see the first murder happen. Conflict, no peace. As we trace through the Bible, we see continuous conflict. There's wars, there's broken families, there's such a mess. No peace at all. If we look in more recent history, we think of all the major wars. We think of World War I, which was called the war to end all wars, but it didn't end things. We see even today Canadian peacekeepers trying to keep conflict down around the world. You see, we define peace as an absence of conflict. We think if the wars end, everything will be good. Or maybe in your life you think, if I simply could have peace with this person or that person, my life would be better. Absence of conflict is the focus. And when we think of peace, we probably think of some of these images. We think no more racism, we think coexistence of religions, we think of meditation or being in a silent place. In other words, we want to find our happy place. And that usually means running away from the daily grind and being away from it all. Now during the world of the pandemic, Peace may be harder if this is your definition of peace. You can no longer hop on a plane, fly to a vacation destination, and have no contact. When you go home, work comes with you. If you're working from home, it's always there. For you that are doing school online, you know that if you're not sitting on the computer on a class, you're doing homework, and everything's at home. There's no boundary separation anymore, and so it's constantly on your mind. There is no peace. Even if you were able to go on a vacation, think back through your mind. You get some peace, and when you come back, it's gone. It lasts, if you're lucky, a few hours before you get up for work the next morning. If you're really lucky, maybe you took a few extra days off. But the peace is gone when that 24-hour news cycle is back in our lives. When we run from activity to activity, keeping everybody busy. I think back to earlier this year. When we went into full lockdown, some of us worked from home for the first time ever. For myself, my classes at Tyndale were fully online. I was working from home. Both of my kids were home. Marilee was doing online school. And it never stopped. And while I sat at my desk and Marilee tried to keep the kids quiet in the other room, it was so difficult to focus, let alone find peace. If you have kids, you know, if you walk into the room and they're not sure you're there, it continues. The noise, the fighting. Our kids are very young, Rose is four, Ezra's two. And so any toy that one is using, the other one wants. There's no peace, okay? And you all have your own stories. You know what happened when you went online. You know what happened if you've lost your job or your kids are now at home. It's a difficult time. We have stories, and for some of you, it's been amazing. For some of you, you've been able to connect with your family in ways you never have before. But for others, it's an unending nightmare that they struggle through every day as they worry, how am I gonna feed my family? Where's the next meal coming from? Who's paying my rent this month? And it doesn't matter if this has been a good experience or a bad experience, peace is still fleeting. We seek places of quiet and rest, and it's not there. You have your phone, and it goes off constantly. If it's anything like mine, you see news articles popping up. You see different things on there all the time, phone calls, text messages, whatever it is. And the only way to silence it is to turn it fully off. And then your mind probably goes, but what if someone needs me? And even the peace of your phone being off is no longer peace, because what if? 
And as you're stuck at home, think of your mental health. Think of how it's felt to be in way less human contact, at least face-to-face contact, than you've been before. For many, this has increased depression and anxiety, loneliness. Again, no peace. But the reason for that is you're seeking peace within yourself. We seek peace through the means of the world, through that vacation, through that date night, through getting your kids babysat. And so it might last for that short amount of time, but it's not lasting peace because it's of ourselves. Now I'm gonna do something that in Bible college they say never do, so you can just bear with me. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a Greek and Hebrew lesson. Now, I'm not a Hebrew or Greek scholar. These words are fairly straightforward. But the words for for peace in Hebrew are shalom and in Greek are irene. They seem like simple words because we translate them as peace and if you Google words for peace in the Bible, these are the key ones in the Old and New Testament. But both translations of peace, when we just use that word peace, lack. You see, both of these are actually defined as a completeness, as quietness, as rest, as welfare. It's not simply lack of conflict. It goes beyond that. It's not signing a peace treaty. It is working together for the benefit of each other. It is wholeness. And it's not about one specific area of your life. It's not about peace at work or peace at home or peace in your family. It's everything. It's all together. It's every aspect of your life. Think about this. Think of a brick wall. When we look at a brick wall and there's every brick accounted for and all the mortars in place, it's whole. It's fulfilled. In Hebrew, they would say it has shalom. The problem is when one of those bricks is lost, the entire wall loses its shalom, its peace. It cannot be whole without that peace. And it's the same in our lives. It's the same when we look and maybe you have peace over everything except that one thing. And you know from experience that one thing tends to then take over. And the peace in the other areas is destroyed. Because peace has to envelop your whole life. It can't simply be in one area or another. And then we think of our lives and our relationship with God. We think back to the beginning of Adam and Eve and they have perfect peace. They have peace with God, they walk with him in the garden. They have peace with each other, working together toward a goal of honoring God. And they have peace with the land. They have this beautiful garden that they just have to tend. They didn't even have to plant any of it but they wanted more. The peace with God for some reason wasn't enough and they looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were told don't touch it, don't, sorry, don't eat it. And they get tempted by the serpent and they give in. And if you know the story, we see immediately the peace is broken. God says you will surely die if you eat of this tree. And immediately the relationship with God is broken. They hide from God, the creator of the universe, or they try to physically hide. And when God calls out and they step forward, he asks, why are you hiding? And they said, we're naked. You see, they didn't know that before. There was no issue with that before. But then there was shame. And when God says what happened, Adam says it's Eve's fault. Eve says it's the serpent's fault. And God says peace is gone. And now there are curses because of it. Peace is broken and immediately peace with God, there's separation. And then Adam and Eve start blaming each other and they get kicked out of the garden and they toil day in and day out just to eat. The peace with God is broken and it affects every area of their life. And this peace continues to today. We read through scripture all of these conflicts. We know of the different empires rising and falling, war and hate and anger. And because of that sin, we all live in sin. Because of that sin, we are enemies of God. Things aren't right anymore. Now sin, simply defined, is breaking God's laws or making him sad. 
It's the easiest way to come to some term of what this sin thing is. But it's those things that separate us from God. We can no longer reach up. There's a gap. God's way up here and we're stuck. Of our own will, we cannot get to him. And the book of Romans tells us that that sin is the issue. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone of all time. And the punishment for sin, the debt owed, is one life. You owe your life. I owe my life for my sins. Not very peaceful. Hopefully you're thinking we'll get on with it. We're not here to listen about the bad. We know the bad. But what does God offer? So we get to Isaiah 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's the prophecy we hold to today. We have a Prince of Peace. He rules with peace. This complete peace, remember. Don't get back in your mind going, peace, no conflict. Yes, ruling king can rule with an iron fist. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about peace in every relationship, everything you do. And Jesus fulfills this prophecy. He is the prince of peace. And instead of bringing peace in the way we think of, with a big army coming in and destroying the enemy, he does the opposite. He lays down his life, not deserving death, for he is perfect. But he says the only way to peace is to fulfill justice. We deserve to die for our sins. But Jesus, God himself, comes to earth, and because of his perfection, he can now pay for our sins. You see, I owe the same debt you do. I can't pay your debt. I'm too far in the hole myself. My life can only pay for my debt, but Jesus' perfect life owes no debt. And so his death, his pure blood, pays the debt that each one of us owes. And then he offers that peace for free. He no longer requires death if you believe. We can accept it. We can become friends and children of God. So, peace We have a little bit of the God aspect, but how does that affect peace with others? Peace with others, we're gonna go back to Ephesians 2 that Colin read at the beginning of the sermon. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. In Jesus' day, we have the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews are the chosen people of God, the descendants of the Israelites. The Gentiles are those who are not born of the Jewish race. The circumcised and uncircumcised enemies, by all accounts. The Jews hated the Gentiles so much, or at least were so scared to become broken in relationship with God, that they wouldn't even enter a Gentile's house. They would ignore them. They would flee from them. There was no peace. Think of those relationships in your life where you go, yeah, I probably don't really want to be around that person. That was ingrained in the Jews. And their witness for God was gone. They stayed away from the Gentiles. But when Jesus came, that changed. He came to be the Prince of Peace. He came to fix it. After Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, he sends the Holy Spirit, 
the same spirit for all who believe, Jew or Gentile. Paul in his letter to Galatia says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Gentile, Greek are used interchangeably here. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Because we can have peace with God, we can have peace with each other. Because God makes us one. We're no longer warring enemies of different people groups. The Bible promises that at the end of time, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and we'll hear the voices of every nation and tongue worshiping the Lamb. That is peace. And that's what's offered to us. When we gain peace with God, we can have peace with each other. But not only believers. Don't think, okay, I have to be at peace with the people that go to church, but the people that don't believe, I'm good. That's not what this says. Romans 12, 14 to 18 says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So if the person that we are having conflict with doesn't want to solve it, that doesn't exempt you. As far as it depends on you, live at peace. Remember, not just lacking conflict, don't just avoid them, but part of that peace is seeking each other's welfare, working for their good, even if they are working for your bad. That's what seeking peace looks like. It is active and a reflection of what God did for us. The second area of life I wanna talk about is peace with our situation. When we talk about others, we probably have ways that we seek peace. But when we think about our situation, it gets tougher, at least in my mind. We're in a global pandemic. Most people are not happy about that. Most people have lost so much. Our freedoms, our jobs, our health, many people, their lives. You're probably thinking, well, it's crazy to suggest we can be at peace with this. Maybe if we went back a year before all of this. But really in this situation, and I agree with you, it is crazy to have peace with your situation. It's not logical to peacefully accept loss and hurt and struggle. It's not human nature. But it is possible. In fact, Paul tells us, remember Paul who gets shipwrecked? He's beaten regularly for the gospel. He's thrown in jail. He writes most of his letters in prison. This is what he says. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul's peace with his situation didn't come from himself. It came from strength through Christ. He didn't earn it, he accepted it. And he said, God, I'm gonna trust you with this, and so therefore, I can be at peace. Even when I'm starving, even when I'm being beaten, even when my life is on the line, I can be content, at peace. You see, if you believe in Jesus, you can find peace with God through the precious blood of Jesus. And through that, you learn to trust him, You read scripture and you see over and over that he follows his promises. And then in your own life, you can probably look back and see the way that he's been faithful, even if in those moments, 
you couldn't see God. We all, if we are followers of Christ, can look back and see ways God has transformed our lives, has given us peace, has changed us. Think back to Joshua. We have Israel, the people of Israel. They've left Egypt to go to the promised land. Moses has been leading. God speaks directly to Moses. But Moses sinned and will not enter the promised land. But Joshua, who Moses has been training, will lead. He's a young guy. He's trying to lead an entire nation. And so this is the instruction given at the beginning of the book of Joshua. This book of the law, the Bible as they had it then, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. If you follow the law, you're at peace with God. And when you're at peace with God, you will be prosperous and see success. That's what that says. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you because God is with you wherever you go. He is there right beside you. You see, we get scared and anxious about what's going on because we are trying to be in control. When we try and control our surroundings or the people around us, it fails. You know that you can plan out everything. You probably had plans for this year. You probably had plans for Christmas and suddenly you're out of control. There are rules in place to keep us safe, and we have to follow them so that all of us can have a safer, healthier Christmas. But we've lost control. We've lost hold of the control we thought we had. But when we trust God, we're told, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When we know the word of God, when we follow his commands, when we reflect on the faithfulness that he has to his promises, when we see that he makes covenants or promises with his people, knowing they're gonna fail and yet he still upholds his end, we can surrender the little control we think we have because we can trust that God has it all in his hands. We can trust that he is there and that he is all powerful. And when the creator of the universe says, I have this, you can let go. You can be at peace. I think back to that beautiful hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. It reads like this. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, whatever my situation, thou has taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Because of God. Because the only way we can say it is well with my soul is if we have peace with God. By trusting in him. No matter the situation, when sorrows like sea billows roll, they keep coming and they keep coming and they keep coming, but I know Jesus. And so it is well with my soul. Peace with God gives us peace or at least allows us to have peace with others. Peace with God allows us to have peace with our situation. Now some people think of God as this big, angry, old guy in the sky. All he wants is our suffering is what many believe, if there isn't God. Other people say God is fickle. He does what he pleases, which is biblical, but many people would say God changes his mind all the time. He sways back and forth, he thinks this, then he goes and does that. Maybe they think he promises this, but it doesn't mean anything because he's God. But that is not the God of the Bible. Our God is unchanging. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
That's why we can trust him. Because he is who he says he is and that does not change. Even from the beginning, he had a solve for sin. If we look back at the curses, Adam and Eve have acknowledged to God that they screwed up. And God lays out punishment or curses for these things. And he says to the serpent, the tempter, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Just as the Isaiah prophecy, this prophecy too is about Jesus. The single offspring of the woman and we see his heel being bruised when he takes on the cross. We see the damage done by the evil one when Jesus suffers and dies, but that's not the end. You see, Jesus crushes the head of the serpent when he rises again, when he says yes to God's plan, suffers and dies to pay our debts and then rises again and he's given the name above all names that at the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. Everyone will worship God, the one true God. As I said before, we're enemies of God when we're living in sin. This relationship that's meant to be together, reliance on God, has been pulled apart by our sins. And the debt must be paid. The life that we have must be given. But because Jesus doesn't owe that debt, he has an unlimited supply to pay our debts for all who believe. And he does that with his precious blood. He wipes the slate clean for all who will believe. And this is what he offers. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. It's not our peace that we gain by believing in Jesus. But Jesus is in perfect peace with the Father. And he says, give me your burden, I'll give you my rest. Give me that damage, that debt, and I will wipe that slate clean. You can have my peace, and I will take on that separation for a time. And then he rises again and reigns victorious. And that peace that he offers with God trickles down into every other part of your life. Peace with others, peace with your situation, everything that goes on we can have peace because we can trust the creator of the universe who made a way for us to be at peace. If we believe in Christ, we are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and entrusting us, to us, the message of reconciliation. Therefore we, those who believe, are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Being reconciled to God is the removal of the hostility. Maybe it's not a word we use all the time, but when accounts are reconciled, they're made right. The hostility is gone. And that is what Jesus is offering. And it's a gift. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have any way to pay for it. I don't have any way to pay for it. Jesus paid that price. He reconciled our accounts if we accept that gift. We're offered peace back to the original design, back to how Adam and Eve were before they sinned. Walking with God, talking with God, knowing God intimately. 
You can have total peace with him, leading to total peace with others in your situation. And that's fine and dandy, but does that affect you this Christmas? Because if all you get is Will said some nice words and he offered us a little bit of hope because of peace, and then you walk out and remain where you are, there's been no point in listening. You see, if our peace is stolen by our struggles, by COVID, if one area of our life is not at peace, the whole life is broken. And the area that we need to start with is peace with God. That's where we start. And then we allow that peace to filter through it all. So I want to challenge you. If you aren't at peace, seek God. Surrender control, and maybe you're thinking, Will, that sounds easy, but it's not. And you're right. We're trained from the day we're born to grab control and never let go of it. But when we release that control, when we say, God, I can trust you, he offers us peace. And it doesn't matter whether you have never followed Jesus before or you followed him all your life. That peace is offered each and every day, every moment. It's not something you get over time, although it is something that develops with God's help. It's not something you slowly earn, but it is something that is offered to be grasped every moment. God offers us peace that passes all understanding. And if you have this peace, if you are a believer in Christ and you are at peace with God, that peace should be shared. It's not something that we hoard and hold on to and say, no, I have it, I can't give it away. It's a peace that is offered to all people of all time. And it is our jobs, if we are believers, to share that peace with our coworkers, with our families, with our friends, with our neighbors. It is a peace not just offered at Christmas when the little baby Jesus is born. It is peace that is hard-earned by the Son of God that is offered for free to each of us. And we are offered a chance to join in the ministry of reconciliation. Let's pray. Dear God, as we head into communion, as we head into a time of reflection on the sacrifice that brought peace. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come touch our lives right now. That as we sit here and seek you, that you would show yourself as you promise. We pray that the peace that passes all understanding would fill us. That in this moment, if we have not chosen to trust in you or if we've wandered or even if we've trusted you, as we seek you, we pray that you would bring us into peace through receiving the gift of you, Jesus, your life. So we ask as we reflect that you would show us what you've done and the joy, hope, peace, and love that it brings. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.